Good morning. Uh, we're uh, we're uh, going to take a, a side trip here. I promised that we would begin a, a short study on uh, how to study the Bible topically, and uh, we will get to that. But I thought it would be appropriate before we get too heavily involved in how to study topically, uh, I wanted to focus on what the results of a topical study lead you to. And um, uh, I have been teaching this particular subject, uh, Were There Dinosaurs on Noah's Ark, for many, many years. Um, most of you have heard this several times, uh, but it's been about four years, and I figured now is a good time to start over again. So if I take uh, particular care as we go through this study, dinosaurs on Noah's Ark, uh, to focus on those things that are tied to a topical, and I'll explain what a topical is when we get there, you'll begin to see that there's a method involved in topically studying Scripture. And uh, like most public education situations, uh, they teach you all kinds of things. Uh, imaginary numbers uh, and imaginary math and fractions and, and on and on and on and on, but they don't teach you how to study. They'll say, okay, your homework assignment is to study chapter four, but they never give you a course. There's never a class on how to study. In the same way, Bible students uh, have a tough time. They can read through the Bible. They can get a study Bible, which helps them understand verse by verse as you're reading through. But frankly, there's, there's no place where you can go to find the step-by-step -step process to study the Bible topically, taking a topic and studying it. And that's what we're going to do. Uh, so you'll all be uh, well-educated by the time we're done with this. To begin, however... Um, I'm going to focus on dinosaurs. Dinosaurs is uh, a fun subject. I loved dinosaurs as a kid. I know Jake doesn't care much for dinosaurs, so uh, he'll have to struggle through all of this. But uh, uh, the, the real question that I wanted to, to address uh, is the one that I hear most often from Christians. Uh, you know, science, my science teachers tell me that dinosaurs and man never coexisted. Uh, there was, uh, the dinosaurs died out completely millions of years before the first man appeared on the scene. Uh, evolution teaches this. It is a, a linchpin for the theory of evolution. If you dissolve that linchpin, the entire theory of evolution crumbles. And I'm not going to get into why, you'll just have to trust me on that. Uh, you can check that out for yourself. But this is an important touchstone because the Bible says they did coexist. And that's what we're going to study. Uh, the reason that it's important for us to understand were there dinosaurs on Noah's Ark is because the Bible tells us in Genesis chapter 6 that there was a worldwide flood. Noah and his family, eight persons total, survived the flood by taking to an ark that God had him build ahead of time, a huge boat. And this boat also housed two of every kind. There was a, a pair of every animal uh, uh, except the worms. Uh, they came in apples. And uh, so uh, uh, there, were, there were actually two of each kind of animal, not to be confused with species. Species is something that man made up. Kind is what God calls them. Um, we could talk about species and kinds for a long time, and I don't plan to spend a lot of time on that. I just wanted to make the distinction for you. Dogs and cats, for instance, gee, there are gazillion different different species and, and subspecies and phyla and the rest of that in, in dogs, and they're coming up with more all the time. Uh, Sharon uh, uh, was talking about what a lapsa poodle or, or Poodlelapsa or whatever it is, uh, they, they've run out of names. They've started being silly now, a, a Shih Tzu and on and on and on. The problem is that God, when he says the kind, he's talking about dog. A dog is a kind. So all of those species and, su and subcategories that, the, that man and science and biology and xenology, all of those things are talking about gazillions different kinds of dogs, but God sees one kind of dog, one kind of dog, one kind of cat. 
So a house cat is the same kind as uh, a mountain lion back there on the wall, or a, a, a puma, or a puma, a bobcat uh, up on the wall behind you there. All of these are cats, and they are all the same kind. So when God says uh, uh, two of each kind went on the ark, uh, there he's talking about the dog kind, the cat kind, and so forth. These kinds are, are very generalized kind of designations. All of the things that we have seen uh, come about um, uh, have, have adapted or uh, uh, naturally selected, if you will, not evolved. Evolution requires a mutation to occur. Natural selection is the term for, for adaptation that takes place within a kind to adapt to different environments that they find themselves in. Um, woolly mammoths and uh, African elephants uh, different, are different from each other, not only in size, but also in hair. Uh, uh, you would think that a woolly mammoth that lives closer to the pole uh, would uh, by natural selection over generations, adapt by growing longer hair uh, than uh, those that live in Africa near the equator. This isn't an evolutionary change. This is an adaptation change. And uh, uh, as Christians, we believe in adaptation and in natural selection. However, uh, we, uh, we do not believe in evolution. Uh, mutation has been proven to be uh, a destructive mechanism, not a constructive mechanism. And so from the very outcome, from the, the very get-go, evolution is, is doomed to, uh, uh, to failure. And, and we're going to see a lot of that as we study what the Bible has to say about dinosaurs. So uh, let's jump right in here. I, uh, I wanted to start with uh, the first objection people usually have to the idea that there were dinosaurs on Noah's Ark. Uh, uh, dinosaurs in Noah's Ark, no way. There's just not enough room in there, and, and they picture in their heads this big, uh, what we used to call when I was a kid, a brontosaurus, a uh, big brontosaurus inside that, that boat and all scrunched up, and there's not enough room for him, let alone the food that he would need uh, and the poop he would poop, and, and all of the other animals, as well as eight members of, of Noah's family. There's just not enough room. Uh, the, uh, the problem that they have is their idea of the size of the boat, not the size of the animal. Um, the Bible tells us that the ark was 437 feet long. If you stood it up on end, it would be a 50-story building, a 50-story building. There were three decks. This is a laid out 50 uh, long ways, the way the boat is. There were three stories, and they weren't equidistant, equidistant from each other. Uh, the bottom story was the largest one, and that probably housed the big guys. Um, you can see the representations on the screen there of the largest uh, sauropods, the, you uh, see the, the uh, brontosaurus, or because or, there was no brontosaurus, but we'll get to that in a minute too. Uh, brontosaurus and a diplodocus there. And uh, uh, they're tiny by comparison with the size of the ark. There would be plenty of room for them. But these huge animals did not necessarily need to be full grown. They didn't necessarily need to be adults. God is the one who brought the animals two by two to the ark. There, these, uh, these examples of these animals could have been juveniles or, or even uh, uh, pre-adults. They could have been adolescents. And uh, uh, yeah, heaven help us. <laughs> A bunch of adolescent dinosaurs on the ark. <laughs> so they, uh, uh, they came two by two with one exception. Uh, God divided them and Noah had... As far as we know, Noah didn't really acknowledge any distinction here. He just took it because God was giving it to him. God was making a distinction between clean and unclean animals. Now, if God had told me they were clean and unclean animals, I would have thought, well, the, the unclean are dirty, and uh, the, 
Uh, the clean animals are, are the spick and span ones. They're the ones that have been through the washing machine, the, the clean and unclean animals. But it turned out after this episode took place that God and his designation of clean and unclean became clear. And uh, we'll get to that momentarily as well. Uh, but uh, the unclean animals came two by two. Uh, the clean animals came in groups of seven. Uh, seven pairs rather than one pair, and uh, uh, that must have been a surprise to Noah why so many of these clean animals, and they were definitely in the minority, by the way, these clean animals, uh, but uh, um, the besides being 437 feet long, and this is a 747, by the way, uh, uh, next to the ark, uh, it was also 44 feet high, and uh, 73 feet wide. Now, these dimensions are given to us in the book of Genesis. And uh, one of the stunning things that uh, scientists and uh, uh, marine engineers have, have realized is that these, these are, are uh, uh, relative to each other in the perfect flotation platform. All sea vessels made today and for the last 100 years are in these same proportions. Now, they can be larger and smaller, mind you, but they're, they're, the proportions of length to width and height tend to be fixed. These are proportions that they have found to be most stable on ocean waters. And uh, this was written 6,000 years ago. 6,000 years ago, long before ocean vessels had been invented. Of course, God was the one who designed this one, and being the creator of the universe, he had kind of an in. So uh, he, he could be expected to do this correctly. Um, the, uh, the average sized animal that went into the ark has been estimated to be the size of a sheep. A lot of little animals went in, a lot more than the big animals. Uh, there was a great variety in the smaller animals and uh, uh, unfortunately, insects also probably went into the ark. What didn't go into the ark were what? Yeah, fish. <laughs> they, they didn't need to escape the flood, did they? <laughs> so uh, uh, it's interesting that uh, the average size animal was a sheep. And uh, uh, this was uh, uh, much smaller than a, uh, most of the dinosaurs. But there were many dinosaurs that were also small. We're going to see that also as we get deeper into this study. The size of the ark in, in uh, area, in area is, uh, was equal to 522 boxcars. 522 boxcars on a train. Uh, if you hooked all of them together behind an engine, it would be a, a train that was about seven to eight miles long. So it was a, it's a huge amount of volume that goes into this boat. So the idea of a, of a dinosaur, even the largest dinosaur imagined by man, being cramped on, on the ark is silliness. Uh, there was plenty of room uh, for, for the family of eight as well as uh, a gazillion animals, uh, although there weren't a gazillion animals, obviously. So this is probably a better picture than the one that we usually see of the animals coming aboard the ark. There were dinosaurs mixed in too. The idea that uh, brought this about, and, and I wasn't the first to have this idea, but I, I latched onto it um, and embraced it and uh, I enjoyed it probably because I had been brought up with dinosaurs and, and uh, I, I, yeah, I'm that old. Yeah. <laughs> when I say brought up with dinosaurs, I mean, I, I was, I, I, I got excited about dinosaurs when I was in grade school and, and uh, I memorized the statistics and I can remember taking tests on, uh, on different dinosaurs. Uh, we had to learn not only what they looked like and how to distinguish them from other dinosaurs, but whether they were meat eaters and whether they were uh, veggie uh, animals and, and vegetarians. And, and then we had to know things like what was the size of their brain, how long were they, how tall were they, you know, and that kind of thing. Um, the T-Rex obviously was a meat eater and he was, he was a hunter and he had those big teeth, you know, and he went around roaring and snarling and, 
and uh, we had to learn that they were lizards. I can remember taking a test on the Brontosaurus, and this uh, this was the largest dinosaur that, at, when I was a kid, this was the, the big dinosaur, the great big one, the Brontosaurus. And I can remember uh, having to learn and being tested on how long it was and how tall it was, and, and uh, it had two brains because uh, its small brains were uh, in the tail, uh, in the, the upper tail, as well as in the head. And uh, there was such a distance between them that, that it, it, it would have had trouble sinking the electrical impulses uh, uh, going that distance. So in order to uh, not have an echo going on inside the animal, they had two brains to control the two ends of the animal, uh, kind of like two drivers in a, one of those uh, 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 fire engines with a hook and ladder rig, you've seen that, so there, there were two brains going on there and they were working in, in tandem. I had to learn all of this and it was tested on it. It wasn't until I was well into college that they announced, oops, we made a mistake. Uh, the brontosaurus never existed. Uh, it was a myth, uh, uh, a figment of, of uh, scientists' imagination. It turns out that they had found a part, a portion of a skull, and uh, uh, in a dig, a single portion of a, of a single skull. And then about three miles away, plus or minus a little, three miles away, they found uh, a hip bone. And they decided arbitrarily that these two things belonged together. And based on that hip bone and the partial skull, they came up with the brontosaurus. Now, paleontologists, paleontology is the study of, of dinosaurs and fossils, fossil remains. Paleontologists have a real tough time. You've seen uh, just how tough it is watching uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark and you know archaeology and all of the rest of that stuff. And the, what you what you have to see between the lines is that nobody gets paid unless they find something really exciting. So you you go out and you start digging and you sift through the sand and everything. If you're a paleontologist and you're you're looking for dinosaur bones. But if when you find a dinosaur bone, and that's exciting, by the way, when you find a dinosaur bone, unless it's a new dinosaur, this is a dinosaur that is older than all other dinosaurs that have been so far discovered. And furthermore, it's bigger and meaner and nastier than any other dinosaur that has yet been discovered. See, that's what you get paid for. So... When you discover a partial skull here and a hip bone over there, uh, you can almost see the gears <laughs> working in the paleontologist's head. These things, we have, we have uh, strict, uh, more, much more strict rules available to us now in paleontology and, and uh, checks and balances, trying to avoid this kind of thing in the future. There have been so many hoaxes that have come and gone during my lifetime. And um, uh, so consequently, they're, they're becoming more and more careful. Uh, there are a lot of people who don't even like to admit that they're paleontologists because they've gotten such a bad rap, a uh, bad reputation through all of this, this period of time. However, we do have one book that is absolutely trustworthy. We do have one book that is the truth and nothing but the truth, and it's called The Holy Bible. And it is not written by man. It's not written by paleontologists or biologists or archaeologists. It's written by the creator of the universe, and he should know. So uh, with that, uh, we have uh, uh, Genesis chapter 6. Uh, the, uh, uh, we'll be going there momentarily. The train uh, would, uh, would include boxcars that contained... Uh, upwards of 40,000 different kinds of animals, the average uh, uh, being about the size of a sheep. 40,000 different animals, um, and uh, sheep would be the average size. And uh, many of these would be in hibernation during this time. How long was the ark on the ocean? How long was the entire world covered? Yes? No. Nope. Uh, the, it rained for 40 days and 40 nights. 
And a lot of people think that's how long the flood existed. But the truth is that the flood surpassed the tallest mountain on the planet, according to, to, uh, uh, according to the histories of almost every culture. Uh, by the way, we'll get to it in a little bit more detail later on in this study. But every culture, every known culture, whether they're still around or not, including the American Indians, the Aborigines in Australia, every known culture has a flood myth. And uh, we'll be exploring a lot of these. And it's, it's either everybody had the same idea for a myth, independent of all of the other ones, or it came from a single source. And uh, single source makes a lot more sense. So we'll start with this. Now this is a, a timeline. Uh, the timeline is uh, 4,000 years from 4,000 years BC to zero. And think of Jesus as zero. It's been 2,000 years since the zero but we count backwards as we go further back in history. So 4004 BC is uh, uh, where creation took place according to scripture. Now the reason that we know this isn't because God said 4004 BC. No, the reason that we know this is because God went to extreme trouble when he was doing genealogies in the Old Testament. He said, uh, Adam was so-and-so many years old when he had his firstborn son and uh, his secondborn son went and they lived until they were X amount of years old and then they had their first son and so forth. And every genealogy has this all laid out for us. So from the time that Adam was created, we know precisely by these genealogies and how they were laid out, how many years. Were. And so we know, for instance, that Abraham was about 2,000 years before Jesus. We know that Shem was 20, about 2,500, and Moses was about 1,500 years before Jesus. Now, of course, there were a lot more people than just these. But we also know that back before, uh, before Noah, people lived to enormous ages. Uh, they, uh, they lived to... Uh, ages that would seem ridiculously long to us today. Uh, scientists have since come up with the idea that uh, there was a, a water blanket around the earth. And when I say scientists, I'm talking about thousands and thousands of scientists. Many of them are, are uh, uh, believers, uh, Christians. They are, many of them are Jews. Uh, but uh, they, they hold at least one PhD in a uh, field of study, and uh, they, they have come together in large groups worldwide. And, and this is not just a couple people talking about this. This is becoming a huge phenomenon. And uh, the, uh, the experience that they are relating is that there was a huge water blanket around the earth and that this was released in the flood of Noah. And uh, that blanket was also a, a level of some protection for the people and the animals that were living at that time. And so lifespans were much longer as a result of this filtration system that was around the earth. Once that was destroyed, the water came down, the fountains of the deep were broken up. There he is. How's it going? <laughs> Sorry. That's all right. That's all right. We're studying dinosaurs. Yeah. Okay, uh, so the ark I've got on a red line there, and that's approximately where the ark comes into play. Um, you'll notice that it's quite a ways after Noah, but Noah lived to a ripe old age. Um, Moses uh, lived to 120 years old. Uh, uh, David lived to 70 years old. Uh, Enoch lived to uh, into his 300s, and... Uh, uh, Adam and uh, his, his uh, cohorts, his peers at the time, were living to ages between 700 and 900 years old. Um, the, uh, if you did a chart and a graph on this, you'd find that their ages begin to decline the closer, beginning with the flood, they begin to decline rapidly until the time of 
Moses when they were at about 120 years old. Uh, David uh, lived to uh, 70 years old, and since then, the average lifespan of man upon the earth has been 70 years. Uh, it's been higher recently, probably because of medical advances, and, and, uh, and that's, that's a good thing. I'm not, not uh, meaning to despise that, but uh, the point is that there's, uh, there's a timetable. There's a, a lifespan that was prescribed at that time, and at the time of the flood, and, and God's been keeping to it for the most part. So uh, about uh, that time uh, the flood occurred, man was wiped out, but not just man, Every animal on the face of the planet was also wiped out by this flood. We'll get more into detail on the flood itself, but uh, this raises a question. Uh, so if dinosaurs coexisted with man, remember I mentioned that that was kind of the crux of the, the whole situation. This is what we hear most often, and most often from evolutionists or naive people who don't have an opinion one way or the other. So if dinosaurs coexisted with man, why doesn't the Bible mention them? Where's the T-Rex in Scripture? Right? Where's that old brontosaurus in, in the Bible? Uh, wouldn't it have been nice if God had just, since he was the author, wouldn't it have been nice if he had just included the dinosaurs in Scripture so that we could have seen them walking around with men? And uh, the answer is, he did. He did. They're in the Bible. They, they just don't have the same names that man has thought up for them since. Now, this, is, this is fascinating because it begins, my study of this began with uh, a weird reference. I was reading through my Bible. I think it was the book of Psalms or the, you know, the, the hymn book of Psalms. Uh, when I, I stumbled across uh, a reference to a unicorn. And I thought, unicorn? A unicorn? Really, God? <laughs> and I thought, and I thought, you know, somebody was, you know, somebody had maybe a little bit too much wine at the, uh, at the table and, and mistranslated that. So I went to, uh, uh, to study on this word unicorn trying to find out what it really meant. Um, the Jews translate it. Uh, it, it, it was actually um, uh, uh, rain, rain, rain. <laughs> uh, they can pronounce it better than I can, obviously, but uh, this was the, the unicorn. And uh, this is in the red there. That's the Hebrew spelling of, of the word. Uh, and uh, I looked up the definition, and there is none. No one uh, today uh, is absolutely positive of what this word means. But the Jews themselves have a long history of associating this with a single horned animal. And... So it became known as the unicorn when the King James translators translated it this way back in the late 1500s. Unicorn. Since then, we've come up with this horse, this beautiful white horse with the curly Q uh, horn coming out of its forehead. And so when we hear the word unicorn, that's what we think of. No. This is a fairy tale. What the Jews are talking about is a unicorn, for sure, but what I discovered was that the Bible tells us a lot about this unicorn. What I did, once I knew what the name was, is I searched the original Hebrew in the Old Testament for this, and I came up with nine different mentions scattered throughout the Old Testament, and all of them are not only this word in the Hebrew, but they are translated into the word unicorn in our Old Testament. And I had never seen it before. This is the list. Now, what I've done here is instructive. This is where I was intending to go in the first place. I wanted to introduce us all so that we'd all be on the same pages. I wanted to introduce you to the concept of a topical, uh, topical. Now this is my own word, topical. Uh, 
It's, it's, a, it's my own invention, if you will, but this is what I did in trying to figure out what a unicorn was. Uh, you don't have to take a picture of all of this. Uh, we have a handout that we'll be making available. Uh, this was only the first topical I did. We've done dozens and dozens and dozens of topicals since then, and um, I've got a PDF that contains all of them. So uh, uh, it's a topical reference to the Bible using topicals. <laughs> a topical starts with a subject, a word, or a phrase, and it goes into the Bible and it finds the original word that the Hebrews wrote in the, in the uh, original language and then tries to, to identify where that occurs elsewhere. Uh, the definition of the word generally is made by the context where this word itself appears, rather than by some man's definition of what the Jews must have meant 6,000 years ago when they wrote this word. So, with God as the author, we can depend on his description. And this is how God describes the unicorn. Not this white horse, but these passages. In Job 39, 9-10, it describes, and, and by the way, this was penned about 1520 B.C. You'll see why I put the dates here in just a minute. But in 1520 B.C., in the book of Job, it's described as a wild, untamed animal. In Numbers 23, 22, and 24, 8, it's incredibly strong. And the word strong may be kind of a stretch. It's not just strong. It is uh, mighty. It is uh, uh, almost scary. Strong. You know what I mean? It's, it's, uh, uh, it's incredibly strong. It's not just a strong horse that we're talking about here. Um, Deuteronomy 33, 17 in 1451 describes it as great and strong. It's huge. This animal is huge and bulky, strong, fat, obese, strong. Um, Psalm 29.6, written in uh, uh, 1024 BC, uh, says that it's fast and unpredictable. Again, adding to the whole idea that this is a scary animal, whatever it is. Psalm 22.21, written about 1,000 years before Christ, uh, defines it as dangerous and scary. Dangerous and scary. Which, and you can see that this is being repeated over and over again. This is doing damage to the white horse, this gentle, mild white horse. Sometimes he even has wings, by the way, right? And so he's, he's not just a unicorn, he's a kind of a pegasus, yeah. Um, dangerous and scary, so much for my little pony. Um, uh, Psalm 92.10, written 980 B.C., great and strong horn. So it, it's not just the animal, but the horn that's great and strong, too. And finally, Isaiah 34, 7, uh, 713 years before Christ, he causes chaos and bloodshed. Oh, no. My little pony is a killer. <laughs> well, the truth is, this paints a completely different picture of what a unicorn is. And it's a picture that we can trust because it comes from the author of the unicorn the guy who created the unicorn and the whole earth and the whole universe, and he should know. So, with this description, I decided, you know what, if, if this unicorn is alive and wandering around with this description, why don't we see it today? Why don't we see an animal like this today? And a lot of translators have decided the same thing. Well. Maybe this is taught. Maybe this is just an allegory. Maybe this is just metaphorical. Maybe it doesn't really mean these things. Maybe God was just kind of painting a picture of, that He wanted us to compare, and you know, and so maybe it doesn't really mean these things, even though it says these things. And they come up with all kinds of ideas for the unicorn. Oh, I I can remember going to the San Diego Zoo and hearing how the antelope 
the, uh, the gazelle in particular. Now, a gazelle, uh, you've probably seen a picture and didn't recognize it as a gazelle. A gazelle is, a, is an antelope. It has two uh, long, pointy horns coming out by its ears, and they go straight up. I mean, there's no curlicue or anything. The, the horns themselves have, have kind of a twisty thing going on, but they are straight arrows, kind of going straight up. Uh, the lady that was doing the tour at the San Diego Zoo said, this is the origin of the famous unicorn. And what people did is they saw this silhouette of an antelope on a hilltop, and the antelope was turned sideways so that they couldn't see both horns. And that's why they called it a unicorn. And I thought, what? <laughs> All somebody had to do was say, hey, and that unicorn would have turned and looked and there would have been two horns. <laughs> Poof, a myth gone before it starts. But no, now in the San Diego Zoo, they've got experts telling everybody that two horns is one horn because he was standing sideways. <laughs> no, what if, what if, when God says something, he really means it. What if we can take it literally? What if it means what it says and not what it doesn't say? Then all of these things are true of an animal that no longer exists. What a concept. You know, back at the time of Jesus, there were no ecologists wandering the earth. <laughs> There was nobody watching kinds and species to see which ones were dying out. I, I can probably count on one hand the species or the, the varieties of animals that have gone defunct in my lifetime. And that's just in my lifetime. Uh, the passenger pigeon comes to mind and the dodo. You've all heard of the dodo bird, right? The dodo bird that... If you tried to describe it to one of your kids, they'd say, what? <laughs> you really believe that? <laughs> the platypus and, and uh, the weird stuff, you know, that you'd try, you could try to explain to somebody and they wouldn't believe you because they've never heard of such a thing before. If something died out quietly along the way thousands of years ago, nobody would even have even noticed, and generations would go by, and nobody would say, I wonder what happened to all of those platypus. The what? <laughs> wonder what happened to all of them. Well, because there was nobody studying them, nobody keeping track of their populations. I mean, the condor almost went extinct some time back, and they're trying to bring that back now. The bald eagle was threatened. How many different varieties of animals have been threatened with extinction during our lifetimes. And that's just within the last 20 years, right, Doreen? Yeah, that's just a just little bit of time. But there's been an awful lot of extinctions that occurred, obviously, before that, all the way back to the flood. All the way back to the flood. So it's unrealistic for us to assume that we know and can see examples of every animal that came off the ark. So if there were dinosaurs, in this case a unicorn, if there was actually a dinosaur that was called unicorn by the people who lived back then, and it died away, it had to die away after 713 BC because they weren't talking about it after that. You see how that works? It just kind of disappeared from Scripture after that. But it was within this 700-year period of time, people were talking about it all the time. It was like describing a bull in a china closet, right? They would have said, boy, don't let a unicorn in your house. <laughs> but after 713, a couple generations go by, you couldn't say that anymore because people would say, a what? Unicorns were, poof, gone. Only the scriptures, which had been written way back when, had any reference to them. And even today, people are stunned to see references of unicorn, even though they've read through the scriptures several times. 
They've read right past it and didn't notice that it's there nine times. Isn't that something? So, all right, you've all been waiting. What does a unicorn really look like? <laughs> okay. Ta-da! Now, I, this is, this is uh, the Latin word for this fossil, this fossilized remains, is monoclonius. Monoclonius. This is what the scientists still call this set of remains. Um, they have, uh, uh, it's famous, and it's, it's all over the world in museums. You can see examples of uh, monoclonius, not just in bone form, but they fleshed it out on, on what an artist's rendition of what it must have looked like in, in real life. Uh, monoclonius is the Latin word for unicorn. <laughs> Isn't that something? So way back when, they called this monoclonius. Mono meaning one, uni, and uh, clonius, uh, horn, the one horn. And uh, how many horns does a rhinoceros have? Three. Three. Uh, how many do, uh, uh, what's that? Triceratops. Triceratops has three. Uh, this one only has one. So this was called the monoclonius. Now, this is what it looks like with the flesh on, or at least this is the artist's rendition. Now, this is an example of a monoclonius running. Okay, But uh, this is not a beautiful white horse with a horn coming out of its forehead, right? Isn't that something? This is a unicorn. And it's likely to be either this animal or something similar to it that the Bible describes by saying, it's strong, get out of its way, it's scary, dangerous, don't turn it loose in your house, uh, uh, even if it could fit through the door. Its horn is huge and strong. It is huge and strong. Uh, it, this is something that not only is named the same, but fits the description that God gave us in the Holy Bible. Isn't that cool? Here's him coming back. <laughs> This is an artist's rendition now of, of uh, what he could have luck, looked like with um, uh, flesh, scales, because this is a lizard, folks. This is not, not a mammal like a horse would have been. This is a lizard. Uh, it, they, this is a dynamite dinosaur kind of, a, of an animal. Um, this is uh, what you and I would look like standing next to it. Um, it's about 16 and a half feet long, and it's about nine feet tall with its head bent down. It's still nine feet tall. Um, the animal would, if it was here with us right now, it would fill the room from here all the way back to the wall. So it, it's a big animal. And uh, you can see by this particular artist's rendition that this is not the kind of animal you'd want to meet in a dark alley. <laughs> Here, kitty, kitty. <laughs> I, I have added the timeline down at the bottom of the screen now, and this is where the flood occurs, uh, uh, about, uh, about 1400, uh, or I'm sorry, about uh, uh, 2400, uh, 2400 BC is where the flood occurs. But you can see by these dots on the screen uh, about 1,500, and again, uh, close to 1,000, and then one dot uh, with Daniel. Uh, they're about um, 450 years before Christ. And then all mention of the unicorn stops. So these, these indicate where people were still talking about the unicorn, the monoclonius. And they don't talk about him after the book of Daniel. Isn't that something? So chances are the monoclonius died out, the last examples of him faded away, or were hunted down, were hunted down. Uh, there were a lot of, of mythological stories about people hunting down great dragons. Remember that? St. George and the dragon. Maybe they weren't myths. But that's, we'll get into that later on. 
So that's the unicorn. Behemoth and Leviathan. Behemoth and Leviathan. These were scary animals mentioned uh, in the book of Job. Um, uh, modern scholars assume that the behemoth uh, is uh, uh, probably either an elephant or a rhinoceros. An elephant or a rhinoceros. Remember, they're trying to visualize something that still lives today, that they can point to and say, that's what the Bible is talking about when they say behemoth. Um, but this is what the Bible says about behemoth in Job 40, verses 15 to 34, written about 1520, 1520 BC. It is the largest creature that God has ever made. Now, wait a minute. Is an elephant the largest creature that God has ever made? Gia, a whale is bigger than an elephant. Uh, uh, and, and even some dinosaurs were bigger than those whales. Hmm. And the rhinoceros? Well, that's not the biggest creature that God has ever made either. Behemoth is a land animal, not a sea animal. So the biggest land animal that we can point to, maybe it's just talking about land animals, is the elephant. But of course, dinosaurs were far bigger. And if God created all life on the planet and the planet itself, then he created dinosaurs too. So when it says it's the largest creature God ever created, it's got a big belly and it has a huge tail and it's testicles are hidden inside of its body. Now, this is an interesting comment in the book of Job because it identifies this not as a mammal. It is not a mammal. Therefore, it cannot be an elephant or a hippopotamus, which are, are mammals. I know that that's gross, but I didn't write it, did I? <laughs> the point is, we're talking about a lizard. We're talking about a lizard here that is the biggest animal that God ever created. Furthermore, and I find this interesting, the passage that talks about this huge tail says, when the behemoth swings its tail, it's like a cedar tree being waved back and forth. Here's the, uh, the elephant and... Uh, the hippopotamus with tails swaying like a cedar. The truth is that this is what their tails look like. Uh, the elephant tail is often used to make bracelets. You can, in Africa, you can actually buy an elephant tail bracelet. It goes around your wrist and, and it's considered to be pretty sexy stuff. I wear my, my elephant tail. Well, and, and uh, they got a little, uh, uh, you know, little tiny tail on the hippo too. These things are not swaying like a cedar tree, right? So it's got to be a different animal. It's the largest animal ever made. It's got a tail like a cedar tree and it's a lizard. It's not a mammal. So what could it be? This is the largest animal that God ever made. It's a lizard. And it's a big animal. Here's another picture of it. Now this is not a brontosaurus. Same kind of shape. Remember the, <laughs> I got to share too. When they said, you know, the brontosaurus, um, there really was an animal. But these two things, the, the, the hip and the, the skull didn't go together, obviously, because just because we wanted them to. They've since discovered what the skull went to because they found other skulls that were similar to this, along with neck bones and such. And so they had the general shape correct. So when they finally came up with the, you'll get a tickle out of this, when they finally came up with the correct animal and proportions and skeleton and shape and all, uh, they decided that they were going to have to name it something other than Brontosaurus, because Brontosaurus had been discredited. So they called it the Apatosaurus. 
the apatosaurus. And the apatosaurus is what we call that animal today. Uh, the uh, paleontologists named it, and it's in all of the textbooks now. Apatosaurus is Latin for the lizard of deception. You see, it was the lizard's fault. He deceived us. So it was the lizard of deception, and that's why we call it Apatosaurus, because we thought it was the brontosaurus, but that lizard tricked us. Boy, when man gets involved, here's them coming across the mountainside. These are big animals. This is, uh, uh, this is the, uh, uh, the different uh, 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 varieties here. You can see a hippopotamus and a, an elephant in silhouette down here how they compare. And way off to the other end, there's a man waving. See him down there? Now, when you saw one of these things, would that shake you up a little? <laughs> ah! <laughs> these fit the description in Scripture to a T. The behemoth. Now, the behemoth is the land animal the largest animal God ever created. He's a lizard. He's, uh, um, and, and uh, when I was a kid, the largest animal uh, that had ever been found was the Diplodocus. And the Diplodocus was, uh, was one and a half times the size of, of the supposed brontosaurus. I mean, it was a much bigger creature. And now they've found skeletons, uh, not skeletons, fossils, uh, that, uh, that put the Diplodocus to shame. And so it's... Uh, uh, it's scary how big these things must have been um, in, in real life. And the Bible talks about them. The Bible is talking about them. It appears once in the book of Job, written just before Moses, there on that dot on the, on the timeline, it's about 1,600 years before Christ, and uh, uh, after that, it's no longer mentioned, no longer mentioned. The behemoth is only mentioned that once in the Bible, in the oldest book of the Bible, which is the book of Job. The book of Job was written before any of the other books. Um, the next books were written by Moses. They are the five books of the Pentateuch, the Pentateuch, um, Genesis uh, through uh, uh, Deuteronomy and Leviticus and Numbers and Exodus and all the rest of those. Leviathan. Uh, scientists are convinced that this must have been the alligator. The alligator. Okay, this is how it's described. Job 41, written in 1520, says it has terrible teeth, armored skin, it breathes fire, it breathes fire, and... It breathes fire. <laughs> it's got a thick neck. In Psalm 74, 14, 1140 BC, only God can break his head. His head is apparently armored. You can't break through that armor. Only God could break through the armor of his head. Psalm 104, 26, in 1120 BC, says he plays in the oceans. This is not a freshwater guy. This is an ocean-going animal, saltwater. And Isaiah 27, 1, in, written in 680, he's a crooked, stealthy, piercing serpent. Serpent. Meaning that he's not the, what you generally think of as a fish or, a, you know, that kind of thing. It's a, it's a serpentine, kind of, an eel almost looking thing. Um, so with that in mind, uh, a lot of people say, well, those are just kind of, kind of weird descriptions. That's probably just talking about an alligator. Well, an alligator can grow big. I mean, we're, we're talking about a, a big animal here. I wouldn't want to meet one in a, in a swimming pool, but, uh, but the alligator doesn't have, a, a, a skull or, head that is so well armored that only God could pierce it. Um, uh, this is uh, a picture. Uh, I didn't do this picture. This came off the internet. Uh, the author is showing where the, uh, the kill spot is on an alligator. If you want to uh, 
a crocodile or an alligator, if you want to kill one, you can take a knife, a plain old knife, and stab it right there, right at the top of his head, and it'll go right through, lickety-split, and kill it, just like that. The alligator and the crocodile can't be something that is described in a way that only God could pierce his skull. This is what I think. Now this is called the Dunkleostis, Dunkleostis, something like that. I'll have a pronunciation here for you in just a minute. I've got a video. Uh, this is a scary creature. Um, it no longer exists, apparently, and uh, uh, it, it's a huge ocean-going thing, and it is serpentine. It doesn't have a traditional tail behind it, the way that we think of a tail on a fish. Uh, it's it's kind of like a big polywog, except that it puts to shame any piranha that you've ever heard tales about. This is a scary beast. The largest creature in the sea, and the largest animal ever up to this time, is the Dunkelosteus. The biggest creature I've ever been in the water with is a killer whale, and yet a killer whale would have been dwarfed by this enormous Dunkelosteus. This 33-foot-long, 20,000-ton sea monster is as fierce as it looks. Bony plates protect its head like a suit of armor. Its toothless, razor-sharp jaw opens in a fiftieth of a second. Sucks prey in. Then clamps down with a bite as strong as T-Rex. You definitely don't want to end up inside the jaws of the Dunkelosteus. If you're bitten by a shark, you effectively have a series of forks stabbed into you, or maybe at some point a little bit of scissor-like action with the serrated teeth. But the Dunkelosteus, with its shearing jaws, probably would have cut you in half. After gulping down its prey, it regurgitates the undigestible parts. Dunkelosteus is the undisputed king of this underwater jungle. So not one that you'd want to meet in a swimming pool. This is, uh, uh, this is a uh, uh, fossil of the head. The, uh, uh, what we have, of course, in fossils is not the shape of, of the fish, but the shape of his skeleton. And the reason that we have this is because this is all bone. This is uh, not just a skull. This is a, uh, an armor that that goes around his entire head, making it nearly nearly impossible for you to penetrate the head, just like Leviathan. Uh, it's a big fish. It's a scary fish. It meets all of the criteria except breathing fire. Now, how can we believe that an animal like this could have breathed fire? Surely God was just being... Um, exuberant when he said this. Um, uh, no animal can breathe fire. That's the stuff that myths are made of. No, if God said it, we can believe it. We can take it to the bank. Breathes fire. How is that possible? I mean, how can a fish, of all things, breathe fire? That just doesn't make any sense at all. What if I told you that there exists at least five different animals on the planet today that breathe fire. And one of them, I mean, and the reason that I like to use this, this is called the bombardier beetle. The bombardier beetle I like to use because it is so small. And this thing is that's called the bombardier beetle because it breathes, it, it ex, expel, expels this, this super hot, uh, uh, cloud into the hopefully the faces of its enemies, its predators, uh, and uh, melt your eyes out kind of a thing. I mean, this is a scary thing to 
to, uh, to face. And so you don't. And that's the whole point. Uh, this is a defense mechanism that God built into this beetle. It's in, it, it lives in, uh, in Africa, I think. Uh, but here, here's what it looks like. But the master of chemical warfare is the bombardier beetle. It can create a chemical reaction within its body so violent that boiling caustic liquid explodes out of its abdomen. By pulsing the jet 500 times a second, it keeps its rear end just cool enough to prevent it being cooked. So it doesn't cook itself. Now, it, this, is, this is not just a cloud of, of smoke, it's a cloud of steam, uh, because the liquid that it's expelling is not only boiling hot, but it is also acidic. And, the, and it's a double whammy. Uh, so pe people, animals, uh, even ants, uh, don't bother it. And that's kind of the whole point. There, there are other animals that also do similar things. Um, the, uh, the fact that we don't know of any fish that do this uh, simply means that perhaps all of them have died out. And it's not beyond the realm of imagination that the Dunkleostis, or however you pronounce it there, uh, was one of these things, one of these creatures. Um, it says in the, the description here of, of Leviathan that when this thing rises out of the sea, it causes a great man of valor to wet his pants. Now I'm, I'm being free with the translation here. I think the correct translation is to purify himself, but it means means pretty much the same way. Uh, this is this is a scary thing, uh, but uh, when when you see the the head of this thing come out on the surface, it's enough to cause a, even a great man of valor to wet his pants. Uh, this is a scary beast, and uh, uh, here it is uh, chasing a little whale around. You can see its tail. It's uh, it's got fins, but it, but its tail is serpentine. It's not not a traditional tail, uh, so it meets that as well. And this is what a man would look like. Um, it's uh, it's not as big as some uh, like a sperm whale or some a blue whale or something like that, but it is definitely much larger than any predatory uh, meat eating. Uh, animal that lives in the sea today. Uh, bigger than uh, an orca, a killer whale, uh, bigger than the, the big sharks. Uh, this is a, a scary, scary thing. It's kind of like having a piranha that's that big. And uh, eat is the only command it understands. Terrible teeth, armored skin, breathes fire, thick neck. Look at the neck on that thing. Only God can break his head. He plays in the oceans, and he is a crooked, stealthy, piercing serpent. He, this meets all of the descriptors given by God in Scripture, this Dunkleosteus. And it appears, the Leviathan appears five times in Scripture uh, between the time of the first book, written, Job, uh, uh, through the time of Moses, David, and right up until the time of Daniel. And then nobody talks about it anymore. Once again, this is perhaps when it went extinct. Now again, an animal could go become extinct for a wide variety of different reasons, but the larger the animal is, and the more dangerous the animal is, the more likely that hunters were involved, and he would be hunted to extinction. Uh, we, uh, we know from the books that we've all read and, and maybe even the TV series that we've watched that the, that the uh, wolf, for instance, was almost uh, hunted to extinction uh, because it was considered a killer. And, and uh, uh, the bison, the buffalo, the plains buffalo, uh, almost became extinct for the same reason, hunters. Uh, the, uh, 
There are lots and lots of examples of this where hunters, uh, uh, for good reasons or bad reasons, uh, were the cause or at least the near cause of the extinction of, a, of an entire group of animals, an entire kind of animals. There's also a sea monster that God talks about, and uh, uh, this is interesting. I, I uh, found this by mistake when I was doing cross-references on Leviathan. Um, this is a different Hebrew word. It means something different, and it has its own series of passages. This is called the Rahab, Rahab, and it is a huge water monster. Um, Job describes it as proud, crooked, stealthy serpent. Now, this, this could be uh, the same thing as the Dunkleosseus, but, but it, Psalms go, goes further to call it a terrible water dragon. Uh, Isaiah and Psalms call it tremendously strong. It lives in deep waters, deep waters, and only God can wound or slay him. No mention of the head this time. This is just, this is just a too, too terrible of a serpent to, to deal with. Um, this is uh, huge because it is perhaps the largest predatory animal that God ever created, and this is in a different ocean altogether than the Dunkleosteus would have been part of. So sailors would have talked about this as opposed to people on shore talking about this. This is the skull of a Chronosaurus, and uh, this is uh, who I, what I think of when I read the descriptions of this Rahab. Uh, the sea monster um, described by God in Scripture. Uh, the Chronosaurus, uh, they found the skull, and then they found uh, uh, enough uh, examples of the fossil remains of its entire skeleton that they were, they were able to, to piece it together. And uh, this is kind of what it looks like. Um, and it's, uh, it's not an alligator, but it has a jaw that looks a little bit more like that of an alligator. Uh, scary animal. It's, uh, uh, it's capable of apparently fresh water as well as salt water existence and uh, so uh, they're, they're not quite sure where it belongs, uh, what kind of family relationships it must have within the species. Uh, this is an artist's rendition yeah, of it in the oceans and um, there's a plesiosaur down here, or no, this is another chronosaur down here. And uh, uh, this is its jaw opening. Uh, this is probably, um, that's, that's the size of the man there. And uh, uh, you wouldn't want this coming after you. Scary thing. There's a, uh, a prehistoric uh, version of, a, of, of uh, uh, Chronosaurus back up here and, and Plesiosaur down here in the corner. Um, so this huge water monster then is probably something similar to a chronosaur, if not the chronosaur itself. This happens uh, again five different times. Uh, two of them just before the time of, of Abraham um, are, are discussed and uh, uh, then uh, during the time of David and just prior to the time of Daniel and then all mention of it ceases. Um, uh, so it's possible that that's about the time that it died out, uh, or at least was was no longer seen. Now, this is kind of an interesting thing because everybody's heard of a basilisk. Now, the reason that we've heard of a basilisk is because it's in the Harry Potter films, and, and uh, everybody knows you get nothing but truth in a Harry Potter film. <laughs> but uh, the basilisk... Um, you can see the picture of the basilisk over here is similar to what they had in the film. Um, you might be wondering, you know, how how radically the Harry Potter films departed from what a true basilisk uh, uh, would have been pictured in Scripture. Uh, but there really was such an animal in Scripture, and uh, uh, it's not called the basilisk in the King James translation, but uh, the Jews equate it with the basilisk. There are several extra biblical writings that identify this by that name, the basilisk. Um, the Jewish word is pronounced uh, uh, pithen, pithen, uh, uh, but it's basilisk uh, as it's translated into uh, Greek and, and ultimately into English. You can see that it's a huge serpent kind of a thing. 
um, and it's uh, devouring a man up here. And uh, uh, so it's not just a snake. This is a this is a basilisk. The basilisk is discussed several times. It's uh, in Job, Proverbs, and Deuteronomy. Uh, it describes this as a deadly poisonous serpent that breathes venom. Breathes venom. Now we don't know whether this is uh, uh, because it's gaseous in nature, his, his venom, or whether it is actually spitting the venom. Um, uh, it could, could be translated either way. But the basilisk has a deadly uh, venom that doesn't require, apparently, a bite. Um, there are a lot of animals that spit. Uh, the most famous, of course, is a camel. You don't, you don't get behind a mule or in front of a camel. <laughs> And uh, so uh, there are many animals that will actually have a defense mechanism that involves spitting, and, and this is perhaps one of them. Um, in Psalm 58, it says that it is deaf or capable of closing its ears. Now, I don't know what that means, but that's, that's part of its makeup. It's, uh, it's a notable description. In Psalm 91, it says very large, it's too big to step on. <laughs> I think that, that what, what we were trying, trying to be told here is that uh, this, is, this is something that you're likely to avoid. Uh, it's not something that you're likely to trip over by accident. It's that big. It's that big. Um, in Isaiah 11, it says that it lives in a hole and it is very dangerous. Uh, lives in a hole and is very dangerous. Isaiah 14 and 59 say it's symbiotic with and related to the cockatrice. Now, we're not absolutely certain about what a cockatrice is, but we'll talk about that in just a moment. Um, the, somehow, the basilisk has a symbiotic relationship with the cockatrice. That is, that they are uh, uh, somehow helping each other uh, without really actually being pals. They... Uh, uh, one does something that benefits the other and vice versa. And so they together, they are more than simply the sum of the parts, if you, if you see what I'm saying. So they've got a symbiotic relationship to the cockatrice, and it cannot be charmed. Because in that day, of course, uh, that was a big deal. Let's charm a, a, what is it that was always being charmed? A cobra. A cobra, yeah. Now, this is... Uh, um, and it wasn't me that came up with this. This is something that's relatively new. Uh, they, uh, the scientists have called this monster, this snake, this uh, scary kind of a thing. They found bones. I'll show you the bones here in just a second. They found uh, portions of the skeleton of this snake. Uh, they're calling it a snake. They call it the titanium. Titanoboa, Titanoboa, I think is the way it's pronounced, but it's uh, it's the largest uh, skeleton of a snake that has ever been identified by archaeologists, and uh, uh, this is a an artist's rendition of what it must have looked like. Uh, it takes a little bit away from it uh, when you see the alligator in the background. Uh, it is much bigger than the alligator, certainly, but uh, that's a prehistoric alligator, which is also much bigger than the ones that we see today. Um, this is uh, a little bit easier to see. It's, it's longer than a 40-foot bus, and uh, it's got a, there's a six-foot man over there uh, in, in silhouette. Uh, the, uh, could Titanoboa swallow a Harley? Yes, it could open its mouth nearly 180 degrees thanks to flexible ligaments and its lower jawbone snapping apart for extra gobbling space. Um, they've identified the, the jaws as sufficiently large that it could, it could actually swallow a Volkswagen bug. So this is a, this is a big snake, <laughs> a big snake. Um, but it doesn't actually, it's not actually being classified as a serpent. Uh, or, or a snake. It's, uh, they call it the, the Titanoboa simply because it's, uh, uh, they aren't sure how it kills its prey. Uh, boa, of course, uh, constricts, um, and, uh, uh, but uh, this thing probably uh, uh, 
uh, lived in the water, perhaps, and uh, came up uh, like an alligator would on its prey at the shoreline when they came to drink. These are the bones that they've identified from Brazil. Um, and um, uh, scary, scary guy. Uh, but this is uh, relatively new, like within the last 30 to 40 years, they've discovered this and, and done extensive studies on it. They're being very careful. Several museums already have examples of this. Uh, uh, they've, uh, they've had artists uh, come up with uh, resin uh, examples so that you can have your picture taken with the, the Titanoboa. And uh, uh, this, you, it, you can't, it's difficult to make it out, but he's, this is his head up here. And, He's swallowing another dinosaur, and that's what's sticking out of his mouth, half, half out of his mouth there. And uh, so you can go and have your picture taken uh, uh, with, uh, with a titanoboa. This is a, uh, a basilisk, or it could have been the basilisk. Uh, like I said, we don't have all of the bones, and we don't know exactly what it looked like, but, but apparently it was this, uh, this huge thing, this huge snake. And it's talked about many, many times. Uh, deadly poisonous serpent breathes venom, deaf, or capable of closing its ears. Very large, too big to step on. Lives in a hole, very dangerous. Symbiotically related to the cockatrice, and it can't be charmed. The, uh, the idea here is that uh, whether or not I'm correct in assigning the Titanoboa as the, the actual example of this basilisk, the Bible does talk about this monster, and it talks about it in such a way that we have a, a, a fairly definite uh, idea of what it was and what it wasn't. Uh, not enough to make a positive ID based on our recognition of the dinosaur record, the, the fossil record. Nevertheless, this is something that, uh, uh, that did exist, the Bible talks about as having existed, and uh, no longer exists. Uh, the uh, uh, timeline looks something like this. This is mentioned six times, and once again, it appears to have died out just about the time of Daniel. Just about the time of Daniel. This seems to be a, a particularly uh, heavy time. This is the time uh, of history when, uh, when uh, huge world ruling empires uh, were. Uh, were the focus of attention. And uh, so there were huge armies of, of men that uh, could have and would have taken it upon themselves to hunt down uh, large, dangerous beasts and, uh, and rid society of them. And then there's the cockatrice. Uh, I'll go through the cockatrice fairly quickly. This, this is almost silly. People have looked at this cockatrice and seen it mentioned in scripture and think, oh, what a silliness. A cockatrice is, is a chicken with, uh, with wings uh, uh, like, a, uh, like a, a bird, a flying bird, and, and it's got a tail like a lizard. Uh, uh, it's kind of ludicrous, and, and uh, such a thing has obviously never existed. Uh, it talks about in Proverbs 23 it being having a poisonous bite, Isaiah 11 says that it lives in a den. Isaiah 14 says that it is a fiery, flying serpent, which is why they add the, the tail to this thing. Uh, fi flying, fiery serpent. Uh, fiery uh, quite often does not mean that it breathes fire. The word fiery here usually refers to the fact that it's poison uh, and, and its poison's effect on you. So the fiery serpents of uh, the desert that Moses uh, uh, had to deal with, uh, the fiery was not because there was actually fire involved. The word fiery was used by the translators to identify the impact of the poison on the people that were bitten. Uh, it was a fiery poison. And in Isaiah 59, it says that their eggs are poisonous. So the eggs of the cockatrice are not edible. They're, they're poisonous, and uh, I wonder who found that one out. <laughs> anyway, it's apparent that this actually did exist. How could we ever imagine an animal that looks like a chicken with big wings capable of flying and a long serpent's tail kind of a thing? Well, it did exist. Um, it, this is uh, what it looked like. Uh, uh, Sinornithosaurus. <laughs> um, this is uh, 
a bird uh, with uh, large hairy wings, not so much uh, in the way that you would think of in terms of uh, uh, feathers, but uh, they are feathers of a sort. And uh, so it's capable of flight, certainly. Uh, it's, uh, it's got teeth, which a chicken doesn't exactly have. But, uh, um, and this is probably what it looked like in flight. Um, it's not what you would think of as a chicken, but of course, back then their chickens may have looked a little bit different too. So uh, uh, this is a uh, chicken with a serpent's tail coming out of it and, and capable of flight. Um, and uh, it, this actually we have from the, from the fossil record. Uh, this is a, a picture, an artist's rendition of the, the uh, uh, cockatrice and uh, standing next to a man. Um, and uh, once again, the definition or the, uh, the scriptural references to it. Uh, the uh, timeline puts four references between the time of David and the time of Daniel. So uh, after, again, once again, after the time of Daniel, they had probably been hunted to extinction and no longer appeared in the, in the records of, uh, of man, let alone in the records of scripture. Now, one more I will touch on is the satyr. Uh, the satyr is kind of an interesting, uh, confusing thing because there is a satyr mentioned in Greek and then in Roman mythology. The satyr was um, uh, a goat man, uh, uh, a man that had the bottom half of him that was a goat. Uh, he had hooves and he played a pipe and uh, 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 so uh, they were, they uh, attracted uh, attention and, and uh, people were, were said in Greek and Roman mythology to have been killed because they followed the sound of the pipes of the, of the satyr. Uh, the thing that makes the satyr interesting to us is the fact that it is also mentioned in scripture. So many of the things, and this is a separate study, and we will touch on this at some length, but most of the world's religions most of the world's religions have their basis in the Bible, in the Bible. So Greek and Roman mythology, just for an example, much of Greek and Roman mythology is based on scripture. Uh, they, they turn it into a sideshow kind of a thing, but uh, obviously Zeus, uh, the, uh, the heavenly father of all of the other gods uh, with the lightning bolt and the thunder and all of that. That's God the Father. Um, Hercules, is who is a, a hugely strong individual demigod, uh, he was done in by a woman, is uh, who? Samson. Samson and done in by Delilah. Uh, Asclepius, uh, the physician of, uh, of the Greek and Roman mythologies, uh, who walked around an old man, long white beard, and walked around with a uh, staff, and around the staff was a, a uh, serpent, a, a snake kind of a thing, and that was his symbol. And uh, they, they uh, still use that today as a symbol of the medical profession, don't they? That's the logo on a doctor's card, is that uh, staff, because he was the, the god of, of healing, or the god of the physicians. They do. They do. They add wings to it, probably because it looks cool. But by adding wings to it, they changed it from the staff of Asclepius to the staff of Hermes, and and uh, that's he was the god of commerce, which is an interesting irony on the medical profession today. <laughs> money, 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 money. <laughs> so uh, it's interesting that Asclepius though came from scripture. Uh, the serpent, the brass serpent on the pole, uh, which is his. His symbol, uh, the thing, is actually uh, Moses, and Moses uh, became the uh, the god of Asclepius, or the god-man of Asclepius in Greek and Roman mythology, because he was responsible for healing as the result of putting a brass serpent on a pole at God's instruction, and uh, uh, it would uh, take care of the bites of a fiery serpent, which uh, they were being plagued with because of uh, their uh, lack of trust in God, their lack of faith in God. Uh, but another sermon altogether. We'll, we'll get there. The Seder is mentioned in Scripture uh, several times. In fact, uh, uh, these times, uh, there's uh, uh, six mentions of the Seder. 
Uh, in Genesis 37, he's described as a hairy goat, a hairy goat. Now remember now, this is not necessarily a man with a goat's body. It's a hairy goat described in Genesis. Uh, in Leviticus, it's a sacrificial sin offering. That is uh, the one used on Yom Kippur. The one used, so it's, this is once again a goat. But what makes a satyr different from all other goats? Uh, Leviticus and 2 Chronicles describe, this, uh, describe goat-like idols called satyrs. They, they are idols that have been made to resemble a specific kind of goat a specific kind of goat. And uh, Isaiah talks about loud dancing satyrs, these goats that are actually dancing. I don't know if they are making music or not, but that's, that's probably where the pipes and the, the music come from, the idea that they dance. Well, we know of a lot of goats that, uh, uh, that actually do, they, they, when they bray, uh, a goat sounds like a kid, which is what we call them, right? Uh, a kid calling, Ma! Ma! Listen up, Ma! <laughs> that's, but, and that's your standard garden variety goat. Uh, and they do dance, don't they? Uh, they do, goat, these goats do dance. Um, and they are a rough goat in Daniel 8. Now, the reason that, that the satyr is unusual and distinct from other goats that are also mentioned in Scripture is because it's got this, this similarity to man, this similarity to man. Now, I, I did a little background reading on this because I, I had a tough time. How can a goat be similar to a man? Well, in several different ways they are. I mean, they call ma, and they... Uh, uh, they dance and they stink like a man, and uh, you know they, they, there's there are a lot of similarities. But one of the the most unobvious things that I've discovered is that the uh, 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 I'll call it the predatory nature of an animal's eyes. An animal's eyes. Now this up here above the fireplace, this is a model of a reindeer. It's not a reindeer, it's a model of a reindeer. But you'll notice that his eyes are on the side of his head. See that? He's meat. And that's why he's got eyes on the side of his head so that he can look in a, in a bunch of directions at the same time. That's his protection mechanism. A predator who eats the meat doesn't have eyes on the side of its head. It has eyes on the front of its head. Our eyes are on the front of our heads. We are predators. A bear, there's a bear, a black bear, and it's hard to see his eyes because his eyes are also black, but a bear's eyes are on the front of his head. The, the puma, the, the mountain lion on the wall over here in the corner, you can see, see his eyes are on the front of his head. A goat's eyes are on the side of its head. Like a deer or, or the mountain goat up there, the white one with the little curvy horns, um, their eyes are on the side of their head because they're prey. Okay? Uh, the bobcat is a predator, so his eyes are on the front of his head. It's interesting that a satyr's eyes are on the front of his head. And that's how, they, how you distinguish a satyr from a true goat. And I thought, a predatory goat? That, that's, that's weird. Turns out they aren't predators. This is an anomaly in the kingdom of, of the animal kingdom. They've got eyes on the front of their head, and they bear, believe it or not, they bear an uncanny relationship to a human face. This is a satyr. Now, just look at, the, look at him from the side for just a minute. Um, you can begin to see not only that his eyes face forward, he's got eyes that see are on the front of his face rather than on the side, but you can probably see the similarities to a human face. It's even 
this is, uh, this is how big they are. They're tiny animals. Mitragus, uh, my, myotragus, or whatever, however you pronounce the Latin name for this. And it's, a, it's, it's a, an animal, interestingly enough, that they thought was extinct. They thought was extinct. But, oops, we made a mistake. It's not extinct. It's all over the Greek islands and uh, uh, in the area where it would have, have been known to exist by the people who were living in Palestine and Israel at the time. And here is uh, the basic distinction between a regular goat and, uh, and the uh, satyr. Uh, the eyes on the side of its head uh, for a regular goat and a, uh, a satyr has eyes on the front of its head. And this is what it looks like. Now look at that face. Isn't that something? I thought... Yeah, I can see that. A uh, uh, half goat, half man. That's probably where the whole idea came from. Notice that that's not the description given in Scripture. In Scripture, it's always talking about a goat. It's the truth. It's the mythology that gets messed up. It's the Greek and Roman mythology that refers to a satyr as a half man, half goat. But uh, this is the picture of a satyr uh, uh, from Greek mythology compared with the, the uh, picture of a satyr uh, that actually existed and still, still does exist, still does exist. He looks like a guy I know, <laughs> a good-looking guy, too. <laughs> Hairy goat, sacrificial sin offering, goat-like idols, loud dancing, and a rough goat. Now, these are uh, what we've been over. These, the, this is a, an example of all of the different topicals that we've covered so far. Uh, there's much more to go in this series on dinosaurs. We've just begun to scratch the surface. I suspect that next time we get together, we will go into this more deeply and, and uh, thoroughly. Uh, there's, there's this whole question of dragons. Dragons. Uh, and, and archaeological evidence of their existence, not just word of mouth, not just written histories, but carvings and uh, pottery and all kinds of things. And so we'll get into that next time we get together. Um, we'll talk about where these things occurred, and it's all over the globe, but um, we'll also talk about the flood in detail and the flood stories as they change from place to place. Uh, the flood story in Polynesia is particularly interesting. Uh, uh, but uh, the flood story in all cultures is uh, not only existent, but uh, in many cases uh, it bears a striking re resemblance to the biblical story. Uh, eight people were saved. In a big boat, Polynesia has a, a big uh, outrigger. <laughs> uh, other flood stories from Siberia have big boats that all of the animals came on and uh, so forth. Now, these, are, these are on the other side of the world from, from Israel and from where the Bible was penned by the, by the inspiration of God, by the breathing of God. So these are the things that have led us to this point. Now these are scriptural topicals, topicals. And uh, the point of doing all of this study on dinosaurs is not just because dinosaurs is interesting, and it is, but what leads us to these conclusions and what gives us a sense of the reality of the past is that these topicals are given to us in Scripture rather than simply a funny word that appears as we're reading through. A topical is a way of studying the Bible with a topic in mind and finding out what the entire Bible has to say on this topic as opposed to reading through the Bible, and the focus of attention is on the story, and when you come across a word like unicorn, uh, you can come to a perhaps erroneous conclusion about what a unicorn is based on simply the, the verses around that one instance, but to realize topically that there are seven instances of the word unicorn in the Old Testament and that all of them have something to add to the puzzle. 
And you need all seven of them in order to understand what God is describing under the term unicorn and so forth. So once we've established that this is how you get there, and this is the objective for leading us to conclusions about things like dinosaurs, if that's the topic, then what we're going to do is proceed, after we finish with dragons and our study on dinosaurs, we'll proceed to a study on how to do your own study of Scripture topically. And uh, what you'll find is, is that at once it is easy to do, but it can be terribly time-consuming. Um, it depends on the topic, certainly, doesn't it? If there are only seven instances of the word unicorn, you're good to go. The word purity only appears twice in the Bible. That sounds like an easy one, right? Well, but purity has a lot of synonyms. Synonym is a word that is a different word but means something very similar. So pure of heart is the same thing as purity. Uh, uh, lacking deceit. Uh, uh, righteous. Uh, all of these things become synonyms of the word purity. Purity is like a blossoming flower. It just kind of opens up and layer upon layer like a mum, like, like an onion with, with skin that just keeps on going and going and going. So next time we get together, we will talk about dragons and uh, uh, what the Bible has to say about dragons. You're going to be amazed at how many times the Bible mentions dragons. I was. The, all of this stuff is nothing compared to dragons. Dragons is a huge subject in Scripture. So that's next time. Let's close in prayer. I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice to worship you, O oh, my soul. Rejoice, take joy, my King, in what you hear. Let it be a sweet, sweet sound in your ear. Amen.